What's up with everybody? Welcome back to the Gifted Hoops podcast. This is episode 36. I just want to say my hair is cut. I'm feeling great. I'm feeling a lot better. I'm in a much better health space than I was before. And we're hitting you with a lot of content before the season starts. I'm pretty sure we have like nine days left, maybe eight days now. So I have a lot of teams to get through before we're done with this off-season project where I've been covering all 30 NBA teams. This episode is obviously, as you can see for the thumbnail, is tailored towards the Milwaukee Bucks. But before we get into that conversation, I really want to talk about the game we saw yesterday with the Milwaukee Bucks, where we saw Dame and Giannis both play together as a duo. Now, obviously, in this conversation, we're going to break down the trade and how Dame and Giannis are going to be together. But I just want to break down the first time we saw them. And for me personally, a lot of people when the trade was made, kept saying, wow, how do you guard a Dame and Giannis pick and roll? And last night versus the Lakers, even though there was no Anthony Davis, sorry, even though there was no LeBron, we saw multiple actions where when Dame and Giannis were in the pick and roll, they blitzed the ball handler a lot. If Giannis caught the ball and he shifted towards the baseline, they would throw a soft blitz late. And then once that happened, they would basically live with their shooters. They let Jay Crowder take many three-point shots, especially at the hash. And more importantly, off of a make or a miss, the Lakers really pushed the ball as much as possible. And they used their size to cross match a lot. If you don't know what that essentially means, Denver in the finals against Miami did this a lot with Aaron Gordon, where in transition, Aaron Gordon would find a smaller player he would get them posted up and when they gave him the ball he would find easy scoring opportunities a play that happened i'm pretty sure in the first half is when rui hachimura did that to dame they gave him the ball he got an easy scoop layup in the paint so that kind of speaks to how you're going to have to answer that because obviously dame and Giannis are very potent offensive players and i don't want to go too crazy with it because obviously chris middleton was not there we did not see him suit up last night and there was no lebron but that was our first look of it i think that you saw a lot of good shots be created out of the damian Giannis pick and roll but again very small sample size Giannis didn't really play any of the second half dame played a bit of the third i think the more interesting part wasn't the dame and Giannis pick and roll but how they were using dame off the ball i thought there were a lot of moments where the ball was moving and just having Dame as a movement spacer and another guy who can make that secondary pass, I think was really good for their offense in certain spots. But another thing, and this kind of leads to what I'm going to say more of in this podcast, you really saw the impact of the lack of perimeter defenders that they had. And the reason why LA was able to stay in that game a lot, even though they didn't have LeBron and they had a lot of young players playing, is the way that they push pace from the wing spot. I mean, they just had guys that consistently were able to get to the basket and get paid touches a lot against that Milwaukee defense. So Giannis and Brooke Lopez are obviously a great first line when it comes down to defense, but ultimately you're going to need more than that to really compete. And that was our first look at seeing this team semi-healthy again. All three pieces were not there. Maybe their offense is just way more explosive than I'm giving it credit for. But I think that's going to be some growing pains for them to have to address during this season. Giannis looked pretty good. Um, he, he was very athletic at the rim. He had a play where he dunked on Anthony Davis off of a quick jab. But some of his shots looked a bit slower in the paint. Obviously, he was still very efficient. So that's not too much of a problem. But mainly the Dame off ball stuff and his secondary passing was good for them. The perimeter defense from Beasley wasn't great. He, he showed effort, but a lot of times he got beat on the ball. The biggest guy that I've been saying, and I will talk about a lot in this trade, is Marjan Bochamp. The fact that the Bucks were able to keep him on this team as a longer wing that can, you know, play defense, which he's solid enough and he has a shot and a you know way to get to the paint on him he's going to be a big player for them i think and i think he's going to have to be a key rotation player for them to answer some of those questions from the wing spot but just wanted to put that quick note in there before we get to the podcast 
this podcast I'm doing with a passionate Bucks fan. His name is Kareem. So make sure to lock in because he says a lot of great things about the Bucks. He's a great articulator. So he knows how to verbalize how he feels exactly about his team. So it was a dope conversation. I had a lot of fun. We have a lot more content coming. I did three straight podcasts yesterday. So all of those will be coming during the week. I might just do a podcast every single day until the season starts because we have to get through like eight or nine teams and there's like eight or nine days left. So stay tuned for all those things. But appreciate all the support. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And without further ado, let's get into the Milwaukee Bucks podcast. Peace. What's good with everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Gifted Hoops Podcast. It's your host with the most. My name is Gifted, and we're essentially talking about Milwaukee Bucks basketball. Now, as you can see, I'm wearing a green shirt. I tried to be on theme. This, ironically, is the only green shirt in my possession, but we're making it work. I want to introduce my friend, uh, Dope Basketball My. He likes basketball a lot, and he's a huge, passionate fan for the Milwaukee Bucks. Kareem, introduce yourself to the people. How's it going, everyone? Yeah, I am Kareem. I've been a Bucks fan since I've been a fan of basketball, like actually watching basketball since around 2009. We made it through prime Michael Red. That man was special. We made it through the years of Andrew Bogut and also the year of Nate Walters, 15 and 67 in 2014. We've come a long, long way since season tickets cost less than 200 bucks at the Bradley Center. I can't believe where we're at. There's plenty of room to grow. I love that introduction because Michael Ray was the bucket number one, but number two, it goes to show you like how far the Bucks have gone as a franchise. I mean, having a top three player in the world on your team, having a top flight arena and having like a very rapid fan base that, that is louder than most people would expect. I like where the Bucks are at, but obviously if we're going to start this podcast, I got to say we have a lot to discuss so if you're listening right now make sure to tap in to the audio versions as well we're live on youtube right now for the full video version as well tap into gifted hoops on spotify apple Podcasts, and youtube but kareem you know where we got to start it has to start with the day and trade there's no way to like try to like go around it and say well how did you feel about 2023 no let's focus on the most pressing news with your team the milwaukee bucks they put all their marbles to the center of the table, and they made a trade for Damian Lillard. For months, as we talked about before we pressed live on this podcast, we talked about how Dame was being linked to the Heat. Everyone thought that Dame was gonna be a, a, a Miami Heat guy. He said, I don't wanna go to any other team, I wanna go to the Miami Heat. And out of nowhere for a lot of people, even though it was secretly there, and I'll tell you my theory on that after you go, but it happens. And now Dame is a buck for 2024, 25, and even 26. And now you have the uh, super combination of Chris Middleton, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and Damian Lillard. I got to get your thoughts. I got to get your reaction. If you remember where you were at when you saw that Woj bomb, let the people know. I was at work. And a work friend who was also a Bucks fan texted me like he just went, hey, yo, hey, yo, hey, fucking yo. And I didn't I wasn't on my phone. I said, what's up? He said, Dame. I said, what about him? And he told me, check Twitter. So I did got the Woj bomb and it blew my mind. Uh, there were rumors that the Bucks were in the weeds, right? Just like low key working something up. And I dismissed it because I didn't think that we were in the position that John Horst was in any sort of position to pull off a trade like this so late into the off season with training camp coming up. But considering the fact that Miami had had taken such a long time working something through or coming to some so sort of a agreement with Portland. It's very clear that Joe Cronin um, held out because he was far from satisfied with what had gone on with the Miami trade. It should have been 
less a little bit less of a doubt in my head that Dane to Milwaukee was a possibility given that fact, but through it all, like from the start of July, once Dame announced his trade request, up until that moment, I thought for sure that if he was gonna end up anywhere, it would have been Miami. So to see that happen, in the blink of an eye, single-handedly shifted my mood towards this season. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, man. And, like, obviously, we'll be fully breaking down their season before this. But I got to say, for me, it was crazy because I wasn't on my phone. I was actually off, which I'm lucky for because all, like, every big trade last year, Kareem, it happened when I was at work. I was firing up spaces while I was at, at work. Do not recommend doing that, by the way. But I was doing that. Both of these trades happened while I was off. And I didn't check my phone. I got phone calls telling me <laughs> about the trade. So I remember a, a Heat fan called me and was like, yeah, they traded him. And he's not on the Heat. And I'm like, what? <laughs> where is he at? And then he said, the Milwaukee Bucks. And I stopped. And this is where I give you Gifted's conspiracy theory, right? I think the writing was on the wall for this to happen months before. And I say this because the Giannis comments, as we'll get into it, right? Like he was putting pressure on this front office to align the team with winning and take the steps needed to make him feel comfortable with trying to resign, which he's done that before. So it's not necessarily new. But I also think that Drew Holiday saying that he wanted to retire or he was thinking about potentially ending his career and making this his final contract. And when he said that, I said the Bucks are probably shopping him as of this moment, especially after what happened in the playoffs with the playoff failure. Right. I thought, OK, they're actively shopping him. And then two days before Drew gets traded. Drew walks back what he says and says, I want to retire a buck. I think what we're doing is good. I think we can like win all these things. And in my head, I'm like, he's trying to not get traded. I think Drew is saying this as a message to the Milwaukee Bucks organization saying, I love you guys. Let's win together. I'll play some more years here. I'll resign. Like, like, don't trade me. Let's make it work. And they traded him. That's my theory, Kareem. I can certainly understand where you may have come to that conclusion. Like, and, and it's and it's great hindsight on your part. Though the angle that I took considering um that first detail that you gave out um regarding Giannis putting pressure on that front office, um I was thinking that the front office would struggle to follow up with those demands of um you know getting someone that'll take them over the top uh the comments that he had made regarding hey i love this city but at the same time if not everyone is bought into that championship goal I'm not going to be nearly as bought into a long-term project as I w would be if the opposite was true. So I was thinking that I, I had less faith in the front office than I definitely should have to get something done. Um, and I should have relied a bit more on what they did for Giannis in getting Drew Holiday for Eric Bledsoe in November of 2020. Um, and now we have two in two key instances of Giannis pushing the urgency button and the Bucks obliging. So they've done a fantastic job. John Horst specifically want to shout him out massively through this all in appeasing Giannis's demands. Let's just call them demands because when a superstar makes a claim like that, it sort of endangers the it's a demand. The, yeah. Yeah, it's, it is a demand. It puts the franchise on notice. So that's two for two on on John Horst's end. And yeah, I mean, like like I said before, you regarding Drew Holiday's comments on I want to retire a buck. 
I, I, I took that as they may have been in communication between himself and, and the front office that, that yeah, um, we love you here. We want to keep it here. And it was just kind of like a reaffirmation of that love for the Bucks organization and Milwaukee in general. But it turns out I should have been a lot more cynical than that. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. He may be trying to push that button in an attempt. I mean, we all would if we love our love the situation of work that we want to stay at so yeah i guess now you, you your conspiracy may be on point yeah it it was something that i monitored heavily because i'm looking at it from the perspective that most nba fans are not looking at players contracts in the years they have left and how that ties into the new cba and how players can actively tank their value right now for instance with james harden like how he doesn't want to be in philadelphia well he's on a one-year deal but the value of that considering how the asset is behaving is lowering the value more so for me when drew holiday says i'm thinking of retiring if you trade you holiday what what can the return like really be that's a question that pops up so I think for Drew to come back out and say, I want to, like, it felt like he maybe saw the writing on the wall and was just trying to say, nope, like, I'm good. I'm I'm going to play more years. I'm Let's do it. Let's win. And it felt like a saving grace type of moment. And then he's traded two days later. And I want to say, I think this is an interesting conversation to have because this is another example of the player versus front office dynamic where people often say players shouldn't ask out of their contracts while under contract because you sign the contract i think that's 100 valid but then there's also these moments where you where a player is loyal to the situation that he signed to and it gets traded out of the blue out of nowhere despite how much love or overall loyalty he has and it's weird because I feel like it's a business. I feel like that's what the NBA is. And I feel like at the end of the day, as much as you Holiday might have wanted to be in Milwaukee, the Bucks have to do whatever it takes to keep Giannis on their team. The Bucks have to do whatever it takes to make sure that the Bucks stay relevant and stay good as a team. They have a bottom line goal to accomplish. So if it means trading Drew Holiday, you trade Drew Holiday. And it's tough. I mean, I feel like Drew Holiday has had big moments on the Bucks. I said the summer that they got him for Eric Bledsoe. And let me tell you something. I am one of the biggest Eric Bledsoe haters out here in the world. I mean, I remember him beating the shit out of the backboard with these floaters. He was pump faking floaters in the playoffs. It was tough to watch. But getting Drew in there made me feel like this team is serious. This Bucks team is going to win the championship because it feels like the positional defense that Drew was playing at the time, ironically, against Damian Lillard back then, you know, in, in those days, it made me feel like his value was crazy. So to see Drew leave is a bittersweet moment, I think, for me. I'm curious about your perspective on Drew Holiday. It's also bittersweet for me because of the value that he provided on route to us winning a championship, on route to us maintaining ourselves as a championship contender for the entire duration of his time as a Milwaukee Buck. Um, in clutch moments, especially within the 2021 and 2022 playoffs, Drew Holiday was one of the most clutch players in the NBA from a defensive front. And we, all, we know the plays that happened in the 21 finals as well as the 22 series against the Celtics um, that can attest to that. I will I'll certainly miss Drew for his overall toughness on the defensive end. We know how capable he is as a one-on-one -on -one perimeter defender. If you're a, you know, if you're more of a basketball fan, you'll certainly appreciate how strong he is fighting off screens. His ability to get to the spot, the spots of the screen before they come so that he can anticipate whether to drop back or fight through them and keep chasing. 
He's also one of the more underrated chasing defenders coming off that pick and roll that we've seen in the NBA. And also considering the fact that he's well built at six foot four, one of the better post defending guards in all of basketball as well. Not to mention the fact that he does most of his work without flopping at all. So as, you know, the purest basketball fan, AKA someone who doesn't overly love Marcus Smart, I certainly appreciate someone who does that. Um, and th that that's just on the defensive end. We're gonna get to Drew Holiday, the offensive player, when it's time to talk about playoff implications. But there is no denying that in the regular season, Drew Holiday is a massive positive on the offensive end. Um, giving you anywhere between 17 to 20 points every night on very efficient shooting, damn near 60% true shooting, hovering around 40% from the free three point line in all three seasons, regular seasons, uh, as a Milwaukee Buck, certainly didn't hurt us. Not to mention the fact that he, while he was a bit of a turnover machine during last regular season, in the previous two regular seasons, as a playmaker, he was more than good enough, especially when you pair him alongside Chris Middleton and Giannis, yep. who are also above average playmakers in their own right. So when you have a trio like that, who can all playmake to some level of competency, that'll get the job done within the regular season you know what i mean this is all what drew holiday has been able to add to continue our chase as championship contenders within the regular season front um did he deserve his all-star selection last year that's a converse that's at the very least a conversation you know him and james harden you know that that that, that is to be said when we get to the playoffs drew holiday as a playoff performer we talked about the moments within uh clutch situations particularly deep into deep into playoff runs that's a massive positive however there are too many instances where you take those moments out and high level performers will outperform drew holiday um particularly guys like trey young um in isolated moments 48 points in game one uh, Hawks Bucks 2021 Eastern Conference Finals. Um, Chris Paul in the 21 Finals was fantastic when guarded by Drew Holiday. So it's kind of taking the taking the great moments with the moments where he may not necessarily be in, entirely shut down, but the biggest elephant in the room is how his efficiency drops yep. off a cliff in the postseason. He goes from around a 59% true shooting um, score to sub 50%. Um, most notably, and this is something that I have off of memory, 36-30 um, shooting splits against the Boston Celtics in the 22 conference semifinals, including a stretch games three and four, the two most pivotal games from a Bucks perspective. They go, they split those. He shoots a combined 16 for 52 in those two games. That is absolutely atrocious. Keeping in mind, Chris Middleton was out. Second option, Drew Holiday is what second option Drew Holiday is going to be. But that shouldn't excuse us as objective basketball fans from looking at him and saying the shot selection can be significantly better. His, ab his ability to understand what happens off the pick and roll can certainly be better his selection of what passes need to be made could certainly be better his competency to competency to make wide open shots coming off of Giannis uh, kickouts could certainly be better all of those factors as a scorer and as a decision maker on the offensive end, dropped off a cliff come postseason time. We were able to overcome that in 2021 because of the sensational play of Chris Middleton and Giannis coming off of it, as well as no doubt injuries coming into fruition. 2022, Giannis had to do everything. Mm -hmm. Drew, Drew wasn't able to come along for one more game 
and that cost us that series. In 2023, game four, he was absolutely dreadful. Jimmy Butler's 56 point game. Giannis comes off. He's got a 26 point triple double. He plays very well for the majority of that game. And I remember Chris, Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday, but specifically Drew Holiday, key turnovers, key missed shots. In the entirety of the game, he was a D minus level performer. Um, all of that taken into consideration, I will always love Drew Holiday for being the third best player on a, champ a legitimate championship team. I will always love Drew Holiday for bringing that toughness, mental edge that sure Eric Bledsoe tried to come up with during the postseason where he, where he was with us, but could never match. He was most certainly a massive upgrade over Eric Bledsoe as someone who can be considered an Eric Bledsoe hater, but you know, given the circumstances, that's kind of justified. Um, and that massive upgrade at the point guard position led us to a championship. So I will have nothing bad to say about Drew Holiday in the future. Obviously, him being a Boston Celtic is going to, you know, give me some animosity over over him from that from a competitor's perspective. But a chip is a chip. Well, Kareem, first off, I got to say very well spoken great points that you were able to hit on with drew holiday my perspective on drew holiday's tenure is he had to be the most frustrating lovable player for a lot of people in the sport and i say this because i remember vividly in the postseason run where you guys won drew holiday and chris middleton collectively as a duo were the most inconsistent star level players that I've seen in a postseason run where Giannis every game is just dominating. They were super inconsistent. But what's funny about Drew Holiday is in a closeout game versus Brooklyn where he's terrible for the entire game, he makes that one shot that you need badly and then the defense is there for most of the game entirely. Yeah. And for me, what Drew Holiday provided for the Bucks functionally was a guy that can provide scoring in bunches. He's not going to be a consistent efficiency guy, sure, but Drew Holiday was capable of putting 20 points per game up and more, but the defense was criminally like needed for the Bucks because while you mentioned Chris Paul did did a good enough job on Drew, which is fair, in that same series, Drew Holiday was responsible for some of the biggest defensive plays and his assignments in terms of switching off onto Booker and nullifying him when it mattered. I feel like when it mattered, Drew Holiday was a much better player than the rest of his time during the game. But specifically, the force at which Drew Holiday would come out and just have the will to win and make big plays next to Giannis, next to Chris Middleton, and the way that he perfectly fit into his role it made that bucks team a truly special team that was capable of winning a championship but like you said the offensive flaws and the offensive ineptitude of what Drew holiday consistently put up it made things very difficult for the milwaukee bucks to continue to have success and last year is rough i don't think all of it can be put on Drew based on Giannis going down. But at the end of the day, when you're the one seed and you have that many games won, something has to be done. Something has to be changed to make things make sense. And for Drew Holiday, the way that he was getting torched by Jimmy Butler, it spoke to the other flaws of the Bucks roster. And they needed to make some type of move to change things up, to make their half-court offense better. And the fact that they got rid of the coaching staff and traded for Dame is the example of the Bucks really trying to make that move. It was so tough to watch Drew being forced onto a guy like Jimmy Butler because did you still hear me gifted by the way? I can't hear you actually. Yes, I can hear you, but I just can't see your camera. Okay, yeah, my camera froze. I'm trying to get it working right now, but that's fine. Okay. Um, 
yeah that, that's fine um it was hard to watch drew having to be put on jimmy because we had no other reliable wing defenders because you're certainly not going to put joe ingles on him you're not going to put grayson allen on him you're not going to put jay crowder the way that he was playing in the playoffs on him um that's one thing it's another thing entirely to watch him get blown by too easily by guys like duncan robinson particularly in game three i know it's talk i know i'm talking about like isolated situations where he may have got duncan robinson may have gotten by him on one occasion gotten a layup out of it but again that's a, a, a drew holiday that's not completely exhausted from having his main assignment be jimmy butler would not be beaten by duncan robinson at all off the dribble so right it's again it's it, one could make the argument that he had such a tough assignment defensively come every postseason series that of course given the weight he had to carry on that front he was gonna let up some on the deep on the offensive end it's a legitimate point to make but at the same time when you are the third option and when guys get hurt the second option on a team that's supposed to win the championship one sh like the expectation is you should be able to handle that and at the very least not have your shot selection f fall off a cliff right you don't have to shoot that step back three yep you don't have to take two dribbles and pull up right in someone's face when you know you're not r rolling at the moment you don't have to take two dribbles into the paint spin off away from the paint and shoot some very tough 12 foot fadeaway just outside the you know just inside the free throw line and again that that's separate from the missed layups that we would see from drew particularly in the 2021 postseason run oh yeah i remember that my hand you know so while ex excuses and explanations can be made for those shortcomings offensively it still wasn't nearly good enough to describe how poor his decision making could have gotten yeah i think for the bucks team in general and that's a big part to me of why they really collapsed last year in the playoffs their decision making in half court situations was never the best it felt like the year that they won the championship they had a idea of chris middleton is going to be the on ball closer for us with Giannis as an off ball guy but also as being the main pick and roll partner with chris middleton so chris can create advantages based off of Giannis's role gravity and Giannis can obviously wreck defenses in transition off of that as well and drew holiday just had to find a way to fit in but more importantly make the biggest defensive plays with Giannis in the in their pick and roll defense and i felt like at times where Giannis was small Giannis and drew i'm pretty sure were like a plus nine on the floor together in the playoffs so by the way i know that we just spent a long time talking about you holiday i promise the dame Giannis stuff we're gonna get into that but this means something because drew was a pivotal player on this team and the fact that he's gone with all of the value and all the flaws that me and kareem just now listed i think it's important to highlight his value in full perspective because the other thing kareem that i feel like we take for granted a lot in these conversations is drew holiday's positional flexibility with the fact that he's 6'4 he's fast but he's also super strong super physical and can bend lineups defensively because of how potent he is and when you have a starting five normally the point guard is the weakest link of your defense but the fact that he was the opposite of that and he was a premium level defender it really juiced up the bucks lineups overall so not having that will hurt yeah and his shot profile was you know very uh very likable very diverse i would say from a from a bucks perspective because within the regular season you know you'd get at least this past season 
40% of his shot attempts came from inside of 10 feet, which I which I love. He's using it, his physicality and his quick footedness for a guy his size, you know, 6'4", to get shots in close to the paint. And he for, like 40 more percent of the shot attempts came from three where he was a 38 percent three point shooter. So it wasn't like he was one dimensional, as you talked about for, on the offensive front when he was rolling and mentioning the physicality. Once again, working out of the post, he was quite good for a point guard. You know, you don't really expect point guards to play in the in the mid to low post, but he knew when he had a complete physical advantage over his opponent and he would be willing to take the ball himself and back people down whether it be from the mid-range area or literally just calling for the ball on one of the two blocks i i've seen a lot of possessions like that i mean obviously i can pull up the stats you know nba.com but again we're I, I, I can tell you just right now that those were sets that were run enough to perk the perk the eyes of the opposition um, and, and were quite effective in getting them easy buckets. So, yep. yeah, I mean, it's and that's what makes it all frustrating. You see that it because it, you don't see nearly enough of that translate when it comes time for the postseason. And that, I think, is the perfect segue into why the Bucks made the move that they did. Because ultimately, Drew Holiday is a great defender, but he's getting older and he is a capped player on the offensive end. So when you keep that in mind, while Damian Lillard is older and, in my opinion, is a much weaker defender than Drew Holiday, the offensive upside in terms of what advantages Dame can create to make Giannis a better player and to make the Bucks a better team in general, this trade is a no-brainer. I think you do it 10 times out of 10, especially when you consider that they had to trade one unprotected pick in 2029 and Grayson Allen. I think that on paper, that internal value, even though this was technically a three-team deal, but from the Bucks' perspective, I think that's a, a steal to get a player like Dame, who for a lot of people is a top 10 player. And for a lot of people is like a top five offensive player in the NBA. And to pair him with Giannis, which a lot of people like, it's going to be so good that there's no like need for some crazy deep take about Spain pick and rolls, off ball screens, drags. It's just no. Damian Lillard, with his volume shooting from three from the perimeter and how efficient he is as a marksman with Giannis is one of the most devastating rollers in the league. When you combine that, it's going to create a drastic offense where teams have to respect them. They will not be the 24th ranked offense during the regular season like they were last year. They're going to be a much more productive offensive team. The defense is going to look totally different, and I can't wait to tell you my thoughts on that. But overall, I got to say, what are your thoughts on the Dame and Giannis pairing in Milwaukee for the Bucks? We now have two black holes worth of gravity on the court at the same time. Giannis's rim pressure has already created all-time gravity inside of 10 feet whenever he's on the court. Damian Lillard is objectively one of the best shooters we've ever seen in the NBA. From a pull-up, from a spot-up, you name it. hes They're both also just considered overall two of the best guys in all of basketball and in their generation specifically to use their advantages that they have either physically or skill wise to be a level scorers and they're both certainly not lacking in basketball iq when you take that when you take how complementary their skills all are yin versus yang 
we the reason why we turn to the pick and roll so much when we're like the, that's the first thing that we think of when we think of a combination like that the pick and roll it's because the defense is going to have no idea who to turn their attention to at one at any given point in time if you want to if you want to if you want to play it one on one just play it straight up it's Damian Lillard one on one in a mismatch or it's Giannis one on one in a mismatch and Take Dame's one of the best isolation scorers in the NBA. I'm pretty sure he ranked in like the 95th percentile. Like he's a very efficient isolation player. So if you do do that, you're still playing to the advantages that the Bucks will want to employ. Definitely. Be and uh, I mean, I I'm getting basketball index up right now just for reference, but I totally believe you when you say that he's in like in from a points per possession perspective on isolation plays. What I would love to do is bring up their the points per possession with Damian Lillard as a pick and roll ball handler and then Giannis as a pick and roll roll man. Ooh, you know what I mean? Right. Because because then we'll be able to. We, we 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 have the assumption obviously that Dame is a machine working off the pick and roll as a as a ball handler. Same thing with Giannis this time as a roll man. I can tell you right now how much more effective Giannis is as a roll man than versus him just working in isolation at the top of the key. Uh, Mike Budenholzer will be tried for his crimes someday, but not today. Um, but like that's the pick and roll. This is just the you know the subject of them playing within the pick and roll but what about the opportunities where they are working in isolation when dame calls for a set at the top of the key where he's got his man one-on-one -on -one, what happens from there to get Giannis open once Giannis gets open gets the ball what happens to get dame open from there now this is very dependent on the kind of sets that adrian griffin is gonna run and this is where the uh sort of ambiguity of the season is gonna come in because we've got no idea what adrian griffin is going to run yeah from an offensive perspective he's he's a new coach we haven't even we like he's been on the court when preseason has happened right but how how exactly how much are you going to take away from did i say preseason i meant summer league how much can you take away from what's been going on from a summer league perspective we need to see in preseason we need to see a few games into the regular season how many spain pick and rolls are they going to run to get dame open at, at like on the wing or at the top of the key how many actions are they going to run off ball where there's just a backdoor cut that's going to take place depending on what type of defense the opposition is going to play what's going to happen when opposition wants to play a zone to isolate one of those guys if you want to if you want to play a box on when on dame because he's on fire what kind of effect is that going to have leaving Giannis open um if you want to crowd the paint if you're going to build that proverbial wall because you don't have any one-on-one -on -one matchups for Giannis, right what is that gonna do with regards to not only what Dame's movement is gonna look like, but what the opposition that's not guarding either Giannis or Dame, how they're gonna react when Giannis has the ball and has a full head of steam trying to get to the rim. So in and around the Giannis Dame actions, surrounding them with shooters is obviously gonna be the ideal move. I mean, with guys like Pat Connaughton, Malik Beasley, um, Brooke Lopez, Bobby Portis, if he can get a shot back up to what it was in 2022. Um, they've they've done well in making sure the complementary pieces can, can do their best to not hinder what Giannis and Dame can bring to the table. Yeah, I think that the offense between these two is going to be the thing that's hard to, on the most. And again, there's versatility because Dame is not playing on a roster like this. They just has this many weapons on the wing and also in the paint from Giannis. And you have guys who, who can fill in and space the floor. So that's for sure going to help. I think this is probably a top five offense in the NBA. I think you can argue that. But I do think that there's going to be growing pains based on the fact that 
Bud was a phenomenal regular season coach. We don't know what this new coach is going to bring to the regular season. And I think they need to spend the season building up their continuity, getting used to how each other play. But I think the offense is going to ha have a much more structured feel to it because there's not much you have to do. I don't think Dame needs to be used off ball a lot. I think he's shown capabilities of being a potent handoff guy. Uh, maybe maybe some uh, Dame Giannis inverted pick and rolls potentially, but overall, Dame with the ball in his hands and Giannis as his roller should be the most efficient type of offense that they can generate. So the offense isn't really what I look at. I'm looking at defensively what is going to happen with this Bucks team because we talk about Drew Holiday being gone, but in the same offseason, you lose Wesley Matthews and Javon Carter. And like a lot of people might not value those players, but I feel like if you look at the Bucks roster now, outside of their dominant front court, the wings are lacking in size and length. And you also lose more point guard POA. So your perimeter defense is nowhere near what it was before, which can make things kind of difficult, especially if we're saying Giannis and Brooke have to be the pillars of your defense, which they'll always be that, of course, but it's just easier when you have a potent perimeter defense to go along with that as well. Because if you don't, and you're putting a bunch of the pressure on them defensively in the front court, what happens when they play a team that has spacing at every position and there's not like some non-spacer on the floor that Giannis can potentially roam off of? It feels like it's going to be proven more difficult and it feels like their answer to that is going to be generating better looks than the other team from the offensive end. What's your perspective on the Bucks defense now, Kareem? It's a concern particularly at the point of attack because of the loss of Drew and because of the loss of Javon Carter. Um, Javon Carter was an absolutely sensational point of attack defender for what they asked him to be. I think, I, I, I personally think that, I mean, fin financially speaking, it might have been best, absolutely might have been best for Javon to go somewhere else because he's earned a higher contract than what he got given for Milwaukee heading into this past season. The addition of Cameron Payne as the backup point guard isn't certainly isn't going to help matters on the um, on the defensive end. I mean, it could it could just be forty eight minutes of barbecue chicken at the point guard position. You know th 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 that could definitely be the case, which is why guys like Marjan Bochamp, Andre Jackson Jr. And Chris Middleton, who we haven't really brought up in this call at all, but yeah. we're going to now. Um, Marjon has to be the defender that we think he is. Andre Jackson Jr. has to be every bit what he was at UConn. Like, every bit the glue guy. Every bit the guy that will be the first to dive on the floor. That'll stay in front of guys that are his size and two inches above him. Um... That'll be the guy to cra to crash the boards at all times. J just be a glue guy. Do all the little things while being a, the good defender that we know you can be. Marjan has to also embrace a, that role, but of a in, in, in a similar ilk, I think Marjan is a little bit more polished of an offensive player than AJJ. I think that's fair to assume that, right? But again, Marjan defensively still has to be there in spades to make up for the deficiencies elsewhere in the backcourt. Chris Middleton in his prime in 2021 was a net positive on the defensive end. I'm not going to call him a very good defender. I'm calling him a net positive where he brings more good than bad doing what he need, doing a job, doing a job as the, the three man. Um, he is significantly more slow-footed than what he was in 2020 and 2021. Injuries have definitely taken a toll on that. I am banking on the fact that he looks to be in much better shape now and has a a fully um, 
fully healthy off season where he's not coming off of surgery of any kind to look to for him to be in better shape from the defensive end coming in the next season because he he is our best wing player if he can be somewhere close to a net positive wing defender that's going to be massive it's going to be absolutely massive for us um so yeah those three guys and Pat Connaughton isn't known for his defense. I know his archetype lends itself for him to be a good defender because he's very athletic and and built and you know. Uh, but but like, he's he's. I think I personally think he was he's better mid, than Grayson mid. Allen. It, yeah, he's he's mid. I, I, I personally think he's better than Grayson Allen as a defender. But then again, that just may be my Grayson Allen bias, which you know you know about. I like, do. From, from, <laughs> yeah. Um, I haven't mentioned Grayson Allen. Um, I think the loss of Grayson Allen is a net positive for the Bucks. Yes, he was a knockdown shooter, but I he he has been and will continue to be picked on in the in key moments, particularly uh, particularly considering the fact that you know just uh, from from, a, from an off ball perspective he just, he just loses focus, and and that's and that's something that. That, that, that's something that I hope Adrian Griffin just drills into the the, the minds of everyone within that um, within that squad, because obviously just knowing basketball, having focus at all times matters. Will make it, it matters so much. You can have all the like all the agility guarding the point of attack that you want. You can have all the rim protection anticipation that you want if you're just focused on where the ball is versus where your man is it makes a hell of a difference it it, it makes a difference between you being the 20th ranked defense and the 16th ranked defense being able to win a championship with a more mid-tier defense rather than a below average defense mm -hmm. aka what we saw out of the denver nuggets yeah which is 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 uh something that i really wanted to bring up because the nuggets last season regular season started off terribly on the defensive end they worked their way into being a mid-tier defensive team at the end of the season there were still doubts over them getting over the line because we don't really see mid-tier defenses winning championships but it, as it turns out they were that unguardable on the on the offensive end and they defended well enough particularly in the later rounds for that combination to work given the roster construction that's definitely a path that the bucks can take on it just takes focus and discipline amongst the squad that we have to get us to where we need to be defensively and the only like issue that i have with that is i agree with you but there's one other component that the Bucks aren't going to be able to have, at least for this season. And it's the continuity of playing together for multiple seasons to understand where to be defensively. At least they have, have spent multiple seasons together where we might not be the best, but we at least know what guys want to do defensively. So let's come together and make this a positive defense, especially with having, you know, Gordon be like the strong person defensively with Bruce Brown just having a structure in place for the Bucks. that is what this regular season is. it doesn't matter if the Bucks are a three seed a two seed a one seed a four seed whatever their season is about establishing continuity chemistry establishing different styles for their success offensively and defensively and getting prepared for the playoffs this is a team at this point that has been to the Eastern Conference Finals that has been to the finals that has won the NBA championship. So when a team accomplishes all of these things and they have that success, when you go to the playoffs as a one seed and you lose in five games to a team that is considered the eighth seed, at a certain point, it's going to be very tough to justify making a trade for Dame if you don't win. The trade for Dame is to win the championship no matter who stands in your way and even if you don't have the personnel now trading for dame is a two to three year plan if Giannis resigns which people 
by all intents and purposes, believe he will potentially resign. But I got to say, Kareem, the closing part of this podcast that we have to address is the team that Drew Holiday went to. He didn't go out west. He did not go to a bottom feeder team. He went to a team that many people have always believed has been a top three team in the East, arguably the best team in the East over the Bucks, and that is the Boston Celtics. Drew Holiday is now joining Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Al Horford, Porzingis, and Derek White as a unit for 2024. What were your thoughts when you found out Drew Holiday became a Celtic? I hated it as a Bucks fan. Um, initially, and then I looked into the trade package, considering the fact that they let go of Robert Williams, a guy that I'm a massive fan of. Massive. Um, I was a bit less... Uh, sad over what the Celtics look like now. Drew Holiday is a better basketball player than Marcus Smart. I will say that up front. Um, the combination of Drew Holiday, Jalen Brown, Derek White, and a little bit of Peyton Pritchard here and there is a terrific front court. Not from a ball handling perspective, but a terrific front court nonetheless. Um, Drew Holiday as the fourth option on the offensive end presents a different scenario to Drew Holiday being the third or the second option, right? Um, I that doesn't take away from the fact that Joe Mazzulla is going to have to coach Drew Holiday out of his not chucking tendencies or inability to see things on the floor as a playmaker that we saw repeated like far too often in a Bucks jersey to take him from what could what he could be which is a great playmaker into someone who is definitely above average but you know not not to that level um it'll be very interesting to see the split in ball handling that's going to take place within this team because you know how how often is Jason Tatum going to bring the ball up the court and initiate the offense how often is uh, Drew Holiday going to do this for them how often is Derek White going to do this when he's on the court you're going to try not to have Jalen Brown do that a bunch of times you know things it, it's the jury's still out on the Boston Celtics to see if they're smart with that stuff because the Boston Celtics are also a team, not just Team Odoka, prone to be idiots at the worst moments. Yeah, the execution of the Boston Celtics has been a thing for some years now. Jalen Brown specifically has moments where if Tatum is not the one creating offense, he's not quite sure what to do. His handle has been a, a point of contention for many years now. But also, Boston is a team that, as explosive as they are offensively, they just have moments where their offense stalls because Tatum or Brown aren't consistently getting to the basket and creating those opportunities, and they settle a lot for shots. And I still feel that that's a problem that's going to exist on this team. But for me, I view Boston as a team that when you add Porzingis and you add Drew Holiday and you're able to keep Derek White, I think they match up well with that Bucks team in terms of we can exploit those wings way more with the offensive firepower that we have in bunches. And even though Dame and Giannis are going to create higher level advantages than maybe a Jason Tatum or Brown. The level of matchup for Tatum and Brown, considering the spaced out offense that they can have and the different looks that they can throw at Dane with Derek White and Drew, both really pesky switchable guys on that perimeter. It feels like Boston is more complete than the Bucks. But the issue, and this is what we're going to have to see this season, is... Boston has always felt on paper to be the better team. 
in the NBA Finals yep. against my team, Boston was the better team. They had a better collection of talent than the Golden State Warriors. But talent is not why they lose. It's never talent. Brad Stevens puts great talent on their teams. It's the execution and employment of that talent versus a good defense. And that's why I say for the Bucks. What is that defense going to look like? Because if that defense is not a top five defense in the playoffs, if that defense is not up to that level, even if Boston is shooting themselves in the foot, they can still find success. So that's really my question. I believe that these are the two clear best teams in the East. And I think to go to the finals, they're going to have to go through each other. Yeah, they, they absolutely will have to go through one another. Uh, in terms of the advantages that Tatum and Brown can create on the wings, again, it just plays into the importance of how good can Chris Middleton be on the, on the defensive end. It really does. 100%. It's why I say, it's why I say Andre Jackson Jr. is going to have a significantly larger part to play in this season than most people can expect. It's why... Marjan is a guy within the Bucks community that's really keyed on, you know, um, like Drew League performances are called out, which whichever league he played in during the summertime, and he dropped like a ridiculous amount of points one day. It, it got called out because yeah, he's he's an NBA player and he's gonna drop any any random guys off, but it's about the development of a skill set. He's incredibly raw coming out of G League Ignite. He's got he, he's got a fantastic attitude coming from where he's coming from. Um, he has the build and the potential to be a terrific defender and a spot up shooter with a proper form. He, he's got good form. Um, so can he take that next step is something that we're going to be finding out very soon. So. If there's any way for those three guys that I just named to up the ante, the advantage for them, for the advantage for the Celtics is still going to be there. Is it going to be there in enough situations to offset what Giannis and Dame are creating? Particularly Giannis. I'm going to zero in on Giannis because his front court opponents are going to be Kristaps Porzingis, Al Horford, and someone else. Wendon Gabriel was just signed by the Celtics. That could be that other guy for them. I'm not going to lie to you. Maybe barbecue chicken for Giannis. I'm telling I'm telling you that right now. Um it like uh, people can point to 2022 Al Horford did his part, you know, did very well, right? We 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 we, we understand that. Al Horford's going to be two years older, and and like and, and that, that is to say, Joel Embiid also struggled mightily against Al Horford last seat last, last postseason run. You know what I mean? But how many minutes is Al Horford going to be counted on to play against Giannis? H how how much are the Bucks going to count on the, uh, or Horford and Porzingis being on the court at the same time? What sort of matchup will Giannis look to attack in? Uh, what sets will will the Bucks look to create to get Giannis in, in in guarding like having one guy face him versus another? But that, these are these are all things that we can say and we 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 can say we wanna we want Giannis to be put in a position where he's guarded by Porzingis most of the time. It's up to Adrian Griffin to instill those sets in, in you know and have them be regular, which is why I'm so looking forward to this season now. I've got no idea what he's gonna what must I've got no idea what he's gonna cook. So we need everyone to be on deck to overcome the fact that yes, the Boston Celtics since 2020, like since they broke open the 2022 season and came back from that shitty start that they had, have been the better constructed team, the better team on paper, and the better coach team. It took Giannis doing his version of 2018 LeBron to take it to seven games and put them on the brink of 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 elimination. They should have won the championship, but they were wrong in their coaching and they were 
lacking, nowhere near good enough in their execution down the stretch against the Warriors. The same thing happened against the Heat. They turned into morons against the Heat. Straight up turned into morons. And again, like the onus is going to always be on Jason Tatum from the Boston Celtics perspective to number one, change, like do something else with a shot diet. Right, like talk talking about like the Celtics for a little bit, you know, what can the Bucks do defensively to play to Tatum's historical shot diet of leaning into strictly threes and layups, right? What can they do on that end? Can they do a better job of exploiting Jalen Brown's inability to handle the basketball, which we didn't do nearly enough in our series in 2022? That all plays into the equation. And I can't answer any of those questions until I see these guys play basketball. And that, for me, Kareem, is why I cannot wait for this NBA season. I think the offseason was perfect. I think this Dame trade sent many ripple effects. Who would have thought that the Dame trade would turn into another piece that yields two of the East best teams directly against each other? It's going to be a very fun battle to see which ideology overtakes or who's going to be better between these two teams. I can't wait to see what it is because I think you can make good arguments for both teams being better. If you ask me personally, I think on paper the Celtics should win, but that's normal. We got to see the execution. The execution of these pieces and who gets hurt or not during the season is going to dictate a lot of these overall conversations, but... I gotta say, Kareem, as a Bucks fan, you were very articulate. You were very well spoken. You broke down your team well. You put on some Celtic slander there at the end. I appreciate that. That was pretty cool to, you know, add some flavor to the end of this podcast. But if you guys are looking for Kareem and his takes, he regularly contributes on Twitter to the games. And I promise you, during this upcoming season. We'll be talking more and more things inside of our watch parties and our live streams, especially when we get to the playoffs. So definitely want to shout out Kareem for being on this episode of the Get the Hoops podcast. That was a lot of fun. We are officially at an hour, Kareem. That was an hour of talk. It didn't feel like an hour, but that was literally an hour of high level conversation about both of these teams. Let me know in the comments, who do you think is better? Are you sad that Drew Holiday is gone from the Bucks? And what do you think the Bucks can accomplish this season? If you like the conversation, make sure to subscribe to the channel. We just hit 1.4 thousand on YouTube. I appreciate all the support. And make sure to like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube and also Spotify and Apple Podcasts for your podcast to fix. Are there any closing words you got for the podcast, Kareem? All I'm going to say is um check ball check ball i can't wait bucks and six as always love it kareem bucks and six you heard the man people we'll catch you guys in the next podcast upload peace out people have a good one take care